what happens when you try to bring a spider back to life? What's going on when you say a word so many times? It stops sounding like a word. Can a smart toilet identify you by your butt? Odds are those questions have never crossed your mind, but they have occurred to the winners of the 2023 Ig Nobel Prizes, awards that honor unusual, unique, and quirky scientific endeavors around the world. The Chemistry and Geology Prize is awarded to Jan Zalasowicz for explaining why many scientists like to lick rocks. Another question I didn't know I needed the answer to. Just like the query at the heart of this year's Medicine Prize winning research, do people have the same amount of nose hairs in each nostril? Joining me with the answer is Dr. Natasha Meshinkovska, one of the lead researchers on that study. She's also an associate professor of dermatology at the University of California, Irvine School of Medicine, plus the founder and MC of the Ig Nobel Prizes, Mark Abrams. Thank you both so much for joining us. Nice to be here. So, Thank you. Mark, it's important to make clear you're not in any way making fun of this research, right? The goal is to honor this science that uh, I think, as you say, makes people laugh and then makes people think. This is a prize we've been giving out every year, 10 prizes every year since 1991. And there's only one criterion. It's that if you win a prize, you've done something that makes people laugh and then think. We don't care for our purposes, whether you've done something wonderful or terrible, important or trivial, but it's got to be something that grabs people anywhere immediately. And the event usually happens in Harvard's Sanders, Sanders Theater. Right. Uh, this year you, you did it uh, uh, remotely, as you did in the last four years, right, because of the pandemic. Yeah, this COVID thing. This uh, COVID thing some, is still uh, here. Some doing things. Okay. Um, but uh, it was posted online last week. Can you tell us about some of this year's winners? Yes. Well, Natasha will describe her own research. Um, we, uh, this is the most difficult thing you've asked me. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll rattle a couple off here, actually. You've got one. That's easy. We've had so many that <laughs> it's like walking into a big supermarket and being asked, what do you see? But there's a study in here about what happens uh, when people are, are staring at a building. How many passerby, passersby will stop and create a crowd, right? This is an experiment done in 1968 in New York City. They gathered a bunch of people at the bottom of a tall building in Times Square and had them look up. And then they watched to see how many of the crowd would stop. And they found out that something like 40% of the people walking by would stop and also look up. So actually, that's an interesting point, is that uh, it doesn't, the research doesn't have to have been done this year. This is an older study. No, it can be older. It doesn't okay. have to be research. It doesn't have to be science. We gave an Ig Nobel Prize to the person who created the plastic pink flamingo. As well you should have. Uh, Natasha, I want to ask you about yes. your research. Tell us about your study, your research that won an award this year. Well, see, I'm in an office somewhere in the state of Washington, Spokane, never been here. And my job today is actually to teach other doctors, dermatologists, how to grow hair. So I am one of the dermatologists that does a lot of hair research and, you know, tries to help people that have no hair. And there's a condition, uh, we don't want to call it a disease, called alopecia areata, where people can actually have zero hair in their nose. And their nose can drip a lot. And they may be prone to more respiratory infections. So when we were trying to figure out how to help patients, we were like, okay, what do we know about nose hairs? Are they in the front? On the top, do we have 20? Do we have 200? So we flipped through all the textbooks and there was really nothing, nothing. Like, you know, those fancy gray anatomies, or at least we couldn't find anything. So we're like, well, let's go and figure this out ourselves. So we teamed up with the anatomy docs and we went to cadavers and we respectfully so um, teased out, plucked out and studied noses with a good team of medical students who were excited, excited. And they're all dermatologists now. So we had a problem and we solved it in a way. It may be funny to the world, but to us, it was something that really helped us figure out how to then now assess our patients and treat them. Okay, so you didn't uh, count cadaver nose hairs yourself. You had medical students do that for you and they were Yeah, okay. we all did it together, yeah. But okay. they, were, they honestly, they pushed me out of the way. They were so eager. They were like, mine. That's how some of the medical students are with procedures. They're like, get out of the way. We got this. So, so what's the big answer? Do we have the same number of nose hairs in our left and right nostrils? 
<laughs> almost, almost. Like interesting things came out of this. For example, people that have been on chemotherapy, they don't tend to have a lot of nose hair. So it was interesting to see the patient. I mean, people that had gone through certain types of systemic medications, it does affect you. So maybe we're understanding more because think about these silly things, but they are the guardians on the respiratory system. They're there for a reason. Even kids have them. So um, those are things that we picked into. And then our ENT colleagues did a huge study where they actually looked with live cameras and kind of continued our legacy. So we we had a funny idea that then sparked a whole nother big study in humans with a lot more doctors and with a lot more fancy cameras. So that's who we were. That's funny great. or not, we delivered. All right. Great. Important. Right. It seems like this is the kind of award you couldn't set out to win, right? This is just something that has to kind of organically happen. You have pegged it. Anybody who tries to win one of these prizes will fail. This is a strange double quality that um, surprise is at the heart of it. So it's hard, maybe impossible, to design something that is so completely surprising that it'll make anyone laugh, but also lodge in their brain so all they want to do is tell their friends about it. That's a really hard combination to invent. Yeah. yeah. It, also, it seems to me that Many people may think of science as being dry, kind of straight ahead, like anything but funny. Um, and doing these awards, I'm, is, is there a sort of a, a hidden agenda or maybe not so hidden agenda of making science more accessible to people, making it clear that science, in fact, can be fun? Well, sure. Science and everything else, anything that appears really dull might seem that way because you really don't know much about it. And if you talk to somebody who does it all the time, well, maybe you stumble upon a very dull person, but most people are much more interesting than you expect. And all it takes is one weird little fact. It's weird to you, but not to them. Um, something that we see happen every year. We have 10 winners, and frequently um, they'll come up to me afterward and say, the other nine things that you gave a prize to, they're so funny, but why did you give a prize to us? Yeah. And I'll give you a, an example that always sticks in my mind. We gave a prize about 20 years ago to a team of scientists in Australia. They had published a research paper called An Analysis of the Forces Required to Drag Sheep Across Various Surfaces. An Analysis of the Forces Required to Drag Sheep Across Various Surfaces. And the phone call where we offered them the prize, that was the first moment they realized that what they had done is funny. <laughs> They, because they live in a part of Australia where sheep is the big industry. Mm -hmm. And the industry had asked these scientists, come in, look at everything we do, tell us how we can make more money and cut down on injuries. So that's what they did. Amazing. And also, um, since you're listening, I, I, I have been in many events with one of these scientists, and people in the audience always ask, what's the most important thing you discovered? And he, he always turns a little red, looks kind of sheepish. And he says, well, really, the most important thing we discovered is it's easier to drag a sheep downhill. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's, uh, that's, that is that was news to the industry. Yeah. They, they have all these buildings connected by ramps where they were dragging thousands of sheep uphill yeah. until yeah. some scientists looked at it and said, hey. Someone's got to ask the question and find the answer. Natasha, what does it feel like to win one of these awards? Does it feel like an honor? Is it a dubious honor? How, what was your reaction? So first I was getting emails and I was like, I don't know if this is real because we get a lot of stuff like we get, you know, you win publish, you get a lot of. So I kept deleting them until I got a phone call from an important person, let's put it that way. And they're like, Natasha, this is real. You need to pay attention. So my colleagues have reacted two ways. I would say 90% are like super ecstatic and they think it's so funny. Like I got a thing today that like, I knew you were funny, but I didn't know you were that funny. But I'm like, this is serious business. But 10% are like, really, Natasha, is this a good thing? And I'm like, you know what? Life is one. What we do brings us joy. We change lives, whether it's one hair at a time or not. So I love it. I love the whole experience. I love the attention is brought to the students who are now young doctors, like, they're so excited. So to see the team being all into it, man, we, we I don't know. It's just been super, super positive. That's great. That's great. Mark, some of the other things that one is you're just going down the list here. There's a, a really uh, impressive, I mentioned it earlier, s smart toilet uh, that uh, does 
defecation analysis uh, and a bunch of other things that I'm not even going to mention here. Um, that that one was um, was pretty obvious, uh, I think. For yeah, it's known as the Stanford toilet. It was invented at Stanford University, and it's um, the inventor is very torn because it might help quickly identify diseases people have before they realize. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's a camera inside a toilet. So there are some real privacy issues yeah. that uh, yeah. no, for need sure. working out. Yeah. And uh, the answer to why scientists like to lick rocks was surprising to me. I assumed it had something to do with taste, but it does not. Well, it might. The main thing is when a scientist is out there and finds some rock that might be interesting, they want to look at it. So usually they'll get a little magnifying glass mm -hmm. or something. but. Sometimes it's hard to see the details if it's dry, but if it's wet, if it's wet the details see. start to pop out. So if you lick it, that's the quick and easy way, and suddenly you can understand a lot more. Also, once geologists, and it's geologists, the people who study rocks who become good at this, but once they start doing this, many of them develop the ability to identify what kind of material, what kind of rock is this by the taste. All right, so, so there is taste in there as well. Oh, yeah. We, we have just a moment and, left. And some of them just enjoy it. Yeah, it's, you know, of course, naturally. Yeah. You would. Uh, we have just a moment left. Are there any others uh, that, over the years that you've been doing this, that, uh, that you particularly like, that come to mind uh, yeah, I'll favorites? Show, I'll show you quickly one, and I'll mention the whole list is at improbable.com. And also, all, most of the new winners are coming here to MIT in November to talk to each other. This is the emergency bra. The emergency bra. This was invented by a doctor who had treated patients at the Chernobyl power plant meltdown. And it quickly separates into a pair of protective face masks. One to protect you, yep. and one to perhaps save the life of some of somebody lucky else. bystander. It's got all kinds of engineering, so just, you just can put, have your hands yep. free and find a safe place to get to. Amazing. And, and she even made a business of it. Okay, great. The emergency yeah, these, these bra. Are for children. Wait, who, one bra, two masks, be safe, yeah. be sexy. Yep. I love it. All right, great. Uh, and so this, you, were, you were remote again this year. Are you hoping to, to be back in, in person next year? I hope so. Usually we have it at Sanders Theater in Harvard, filled with 1,200 people in the audience. We always have a bunch of Nobel Prize winners there handing out the prizes. We had 10 of them this year. And people throw paper airplanes. That was something the audience invented, and we keep doing it. And yeah. it's a circus. Well, the, the video that came out that you put out just last week is a ton of fun to watch, and, and people can find it online. Um, uh, Mark Abrams and Natasha Meslinskova, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me.